Kidney stones are basically just crystals that form in the urine. Uh, they're usually composed of a couple of components, most commonly uh, calcium and also oxalate. And kidney stones precipitate out of the urine when they become supersaturated, and essentially they're small crystals that then form into the aggregate of a stone, and that's commonly what's called a, a, a kidney stone. The cause can be very um, widespread, uh, can range anything from uh, typical uh, dietary uh, causes to other etiologies that involve hormone imbalance, uh, metabolic disorders, and um, dietary changes. A very small number of kidney stones can also be caused from hereditary reasons as well, can run in families. Most common symptoms that usually people will present with is flank pain, and it's usually very severe flank pain that comes out of nowhere. And then it's, it develops into what's called colicky pain, where the pain comes and goes. Initially, when the stone starts to pass, the um, pain will start in the back, but as the kidney stone moves down near the bladder, the pain actually can move and start to become in the lower part of the abdomen as well, more on the front side. Besides flank pain, people can sometimes see blood in the urine. Uh, they can have difficulty urinating, and sometimes they'll have more urinary frequency and urgency as well. They're most commonly very painful, but sometimes they can also be quite dangerous. Um, if they block the kidney for an extended period of time, they can sometimes cause the kidneys not to work very well. Um, also, in the setting of an infection, kidney stones can be quite dangerous and can cause people um, to become what's called septic, where they have uh, fevers and drops in their blood pressure. The best way is the imaging modality. Uh, the most sensitive way to detect stones uh, these days is a CAT scan of the abdomen and pelvis. Um, some of the older uh, methods are uh, plain film x-ray called a KUB. Uh, also we use ultrasound uh, very common, uh, more commonly for uh, screening patients um, and to t see if the kidney is blocked by stones. There are several treatments based on the size of the stone, the location of the stone, and what the patient's overall uh, medical conditions are. Um, some people will favor a uh, conservative approach where we can actually give medications to help pass the stone spontaneously. Um, if that doesn't work, usually some kind of surgical intervention is required. We do very minimally invasive type procedures uh, called lithotripsy, where we can actually send uh, shock waves from outside the skin to focus on the stone inside the kidney and break up the stone that way. Uh, more aggressive treatments are ureteroscopy, where we actually would go through the bladder and up to the ureter to break up the stone with the laser fiber. And then lastly, um, very large stones that are uh, stuck in the kidney, uh, we would do a procedure called a percutaneous nephrolithotomy, where we actually make a small incision in the kidney in order to tr take out the large stone fragments that way. If the stone um, is up in the kidney, then you can usually receive lithotripsy or the percutaneous nephrolithotomy. However, if the, ki if the stone is uh, lower in the ureter or the, uh, near the bladder, then usually ureteroscopy is the preferred method. Probably the most important thing is hydration. Uh, we usually recommend that patients uh, drink more than two liters of water a day. It, go it goes back to what I said earlier about the uh, stones just acting as crystals. So the more fluid you drink, the more dilute the urine, and that helps prevent the stones from forming in the first place. Um, all the other things you can do as a general, uh, general guidelines are to decrease your protein in the diet, as well as to decrease the amount of oxalate that you eat. Um, high oxalate foods are usually in things like spinach, uh, kale, peanuts, and uh, aged foods. Mm -hmm.